grab your pre-workout and turn up that volume. It is time for a new episode of the Powerlifters Den with your host, Cam Smith. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Powerlifters Den. I'm your host, Cam Smith, and today I wanted to bring on Rodney Woodward Jr., who trains down in Virginia and uh, recently set himself in the records book with the fourth highest total of all time. If I'm correct, Rodney, why don't you introduce yourself? What's up, I'm Rodney? Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, you're right. I did. Uh, I think it ended up being like 29.43. Yep. I think that's number four all time. Yeah, yeah. So I guess we can start off by talking about that meet itself before we get into your background, since it's fresh on the mind. Um, I'm assuming the goal for that day was 3K, uh, based off the attempts and things. But uh, being able to total over 29 is certainly a hell of a day as well. Yeah, that was the plan to go. 3,000. Um, I just missed the 1,003 on the bench. Um, missed it right at the top. Just didn't get a, a rack command from Cole, which was the right call because it, it fell. If you watch the video, it fell back. Um, and then just missed 788 for the deadlift on a third attempt, too. So it is what it is. It's not the last meet I'm going to do. I'll take a run at it again here shortly. Absolutely. So I guess kind of going into that meet. Um, obviously you, you had your eye on that goal and kind of had to play in your attempts accordingly. Your, I know your best deadlift before that was, I believe, 782. Yes. So you only needed to go for that six pound PR and, um, obviously hitting that bench would have set you up well. So what was kind of your mindset going into deadlifts for, the, for that pull after your bench? Um, I was trying to keep it to not having to come down to the deadlift because like, that's probably, it's not my best lift. It's the one I probably struggle with the most. So I was really hoping that it wasn't going to come down to that because I think most people have been doing this long enough, like trying to pull a PR deadlift after setting two big PRs in the squat and the bench is kind of a not going to happen. But, I mean, I put it in there, pulled 7088 right to lockout, and then just couldn't finish it. I didn't have any gas left. I was, I was done. So that really wasn't the plan. Like I said, the plan was to bench a grand and then only have to pull enough to total 3,000, but that's not how it goes sometimes. Yeah, and uh, we can talk about your squat a little bit. Obviously, 1251 is an absolutely monster squat and um, something that a lot of people probably are baffled by is the fact that you squat in sleeves. So um, maybe tell us a little bit about why you chose sleeves and why for you it doesn't really make a huge difference to try to get wraps on. So when I first started, I competed in wraps for a little bit. When I did, uh, I competed, did one meet raw. And then my first meet was a single ply meet and I wrapped myself and that was a pain in the ass. And then when I started training that CVA barbell, nobody there really used knee wraps. So, I mean, the guys would help me put them on or whatnot, but we just not something anybody there really did. So finally it just came down to, I timed out one time, missed a squat. I just, I just hate them. They're such a pain in the ass to deal with. And then I started squatting without them. And, uh, I think in the long run it worked out good because, you know, I got really good at using the suit. Like I run my straps really tight for the most part. And, uh, I just, I just have no problem not using them. I just recently switched to using knee sleeves just because I tried wraps again and it's just a training issue. It's just me. Like obviously wraps work. There's people that squat huge weights and wraps. Um, I just need to use them more because they are eventually probably going to get to a point where I need to use them to get some more weight on the bar. So, but for now the sleeves work out good. I don't wear them super tight. I put them on, take them off by myself. Um, that's all really, it's all really boils down to. I just don't like wraps. As far as your suit goes, I know you use a canvas suit, but um, something I noticed about your suit that I haven't seen on any of the suits is um, all those different straps and things on it. So where did you kind of get that suit from and how does that work for you? That's an original metal suit. Long ago, metal made their own canvas suits and it has the adjustable legs on it. Um, I'm a huge fan of it. I don't know why other people haven't kind of put it on there. Um, I tried one of those ultra pros, just too much stuff to mess with. I didn't like having that much stuff to adjust. Yeah. Uh, so I went back to using that 
and uh, I just like it. The leg traps make it perfect because, you know, some days you weigh a little bit more than others. It just gives you that adjustability of, you know, if your weight's off or maybe you don't weigh enough, you can crank those things down and make that thing fit right. Yeah, I think that's what I really like about the LUP is that um, you can kind of adjust it as you go. And for someone like me that's newer in the gear, as I'm progressing and learning it more, I can go tighter and tighter and tighter versus getting a canvas where you have like a 10-pound window of body weight where it can right. ruin your whole day. Right. <clears throat> and then uh, backtracking a little bit, you said you started off, uh, you did a raw meet, you did some single ply. So uh, maybe tell us about when you did your first powerlifting meet and kind of who got you into it. So I first started uh, probably with strength sports, like as a little kid, like they used to still play world's strongest man on the TV. Yep. And I always wanted to do that. I thought it was the coolest thing ever, but really there was nowhere to train that coming up. I mean, I trained obviously with the weights. I played football and stuff like that. Um, I didn't really get into powerlifting until probably I was 20, 19 or 20. I think it was, um, I had a job as a bouncer. And the guy that got me at the job was like, hey, man, this dude, Elliot, you got to talk to him. He's this gigantic human being, and uh, he'll get you hooked up. So I went and talked to him, and he was. The dude looks like Goldberg. He was on the Marine Corps powerlifting team. And uh, I, at this point, like, I had no idea that powerlifting was like a sport, like a thing you did. It was just, you know what I mean? So I started training with him. We did a... Uh, a deadlift only meet down in Walker's gym in uh, Virginia here. And uh, at this point, I still don't know that, like I said, like the squat bench and the deadlift are all something you compete at. So he ended up getting a shoulder replacement and he was like, look, dude, I'm, I'm kind of done. Uh, I hate to leave you on your own, but you're on your own. I was like, all right, man, no big deal. So then uh, brute strength gym, that was used to be down like Virginia beach area here. They sent up a flyer. I was working at the gym at this point, running the front desk at nighttime. And, uh, they sent up a flyer for a meet. And that was the one I signed up for it. I signed up, competed in wraps. I think I did like five twenty five, three thirty, and like six twenty five, maybe something like that. If I remember right. <clears throat> and, uh, happened to read a flex magazine article that was in the gym and it was the first time i'd heard about west side barbell they louis simmons was writing articles for them and of course i'm reading through this thing and it was back when you know aj was still training there luke edwards all those guys and i'm reading about these dudes squatting a thousand pounds squatting 1100 pounds just all this wild stuff i never knew was a thing and that was it. I was like, I got to do that. I got to see if I can do that. Um, went on the old powerliftingwatch.com, that old website. I found a ad for CVA Barbell where I train at now. And that's been that. I showed up like a week later. Um, I bought some single ply gear because most of those guys were training in gear at the time and competing in gear. And then I did, a, I did one single ply meet. I squatted. I think I totaled like 17 or 1800, something like that, if I remember. And then uh, around, I got in multiply gear and then I squatted my first thousand in 2012. Yeah. So from going into single ply to multiply, uh, I guess at that time, what was one of the, the bigger differences that you noticed between the two divisions? Uh, definitely the, the technique and using the gear, like I could just kind of use the single ply stuff. I didn't have the greatest technique, but I was strong. So I could just kind of make it work. Whereas trying that with multiply, it doesn't work. That's how you get your teeth knocked out. So you, you know, fall over in the squat, like just not good. Yeah. And then, so I guess going into that too, with obviously, um, things can kind of be more when things go wrong and multiply, they go a lot 
more wrong than raw and things like that. Um, maybe some of the moments that you've had that were maybe a, a squat that didn't go so well or dump at a bench or just some of the scary moments that you've encountered. Um, probably the, probably the worst one I can think so far. And it, it wasn't anybody's you know fault. Um, I was doing, I followed the West side barbell, everything that Louis Simmons, I followed it to the T for the most part for a long time. So I was doing Circumax. Oh boy. And, uh, I had, you know, the 450 pounds of band tension on there. I was working up for a single, I think it was like, I was on probably almost like 700 pounds in bar weight. Anyhow, as I was going down, I kind of lost my air a little bit, lost my brace. I ended up cracking two of my lower ribs and I pretty much held that squat on like one leg and stood back up with it. It was, it was a fucking spectacle. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I ended up going to the hospital and it was funny cause the, the nurse, she came in, she was like, so what were you doing? And I explained it to her, you know, I get like a sideways look. She's like, why would you do that? Yeah. And it's so funny <laughs> trying to explain, um, powerlifting to, I guess like what you would call a normal person, but yeah. especially multiply. Cause they're like, what, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> um, then some other ones, they weren't too wild, especially because obviously I switched over and compete in uh, Unlimited now. So the band shirts, you know, those add another, I think, level to it, especially, you know, if you're a little bit off, like that thing's going to chop your head off. Yeah. So um, for, for you, um, sorry to interrupt, but for you, obviously, you've had experience in poly and in the, the band shirt now. For you, what are some of the biggest differences in terms of maybe what makes it a little bit easier to use and what makes it a little bit more difficult. I think the biggest trade-off between the two is obviously the weight. Um, with the poly shirt, you know, it does give you the support on the way down. So it kind of gives you a, a shelf, if you will, to, to bring that bar into and some control. Um, definitely more technique, obviously. Um, whereas the band shirt, you know, you can use a tremendous amount of weight, but if you don't already have good technique, you're never going to make that tremendous amount of weight move. Yeah. And it's kind of the first couple times, you know, you're bringing that weight down, you realize like, it's just you, you're just, I mean, it, obviously the shirt gives you some resistance, but it's more up. Like when you go to reverse that weight, that's when you get the, the feeling of that shirt. But, um, I personally, I think a lot of the people I watch and like unlimited and stuff, you know, and kind of the thing I tell the guys at the gym and stuff, if you're really good at like benching in a poly shirt, you're going to be really good benching in a unlimited shirt mm -hmm. in a band. Shirt. Yeah. And then for, for the band shirt itself, how many times have you competed in that? Um, Sorry, my dog's in here trying to get in the camera. Um, I think it's been, I've done Matt Brooks's meet three times now. And then I did the showdown, obviously. I didn't bench that day. Yeah. Um, I think four. So it's been four, four training cycles, I think. I'm pretty sure in that unlimited shirt. So something that I'm kind of curious about and something that um, a few people have said that um, if you're competing when you are competing in a band shirt versus uh, poly, obviously the band shirt allows you to bench more, but um, some people are saying that the being in the band shirt takes way less um, fatigue in terms of going into deadlifts and kind of being able to actually like full send on your squat. So what is your uh, experience with that in terms of getting through a meet day with both? Probably, probably definitely I see what they're saying. It is a little less fatigued because you're not, you're not fighting the shirt as much. I think the trade-off with that though is the weight you're handling. Mm -hmm. If you're, you know, successful in pressing it, that's the thing. Um, I would agree with that though. Like it, it's definitely not as, not as fatiguing. Um, but I think, like I said, you couple that with, if you PR, definitely for me, at least, uh, like if I PR my squat and my bench on the same day, like it's been, 
historically, like I'm probably not going to get a PR on the deadlift. Like that's just how it rolls, but it's definitely a little, uh, takes a little less out of you with the band shirts. I would say definitely. Cause like I said, you're not fighting the shirt as much. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of like the, um, obviously there's still pressure in the shirt, but just kind of dealing with like that, like the less fight and the less pressure, um, obviously can take a little bit of less strain on your body. But like you said, it's, if you're adding an extra 200, 300 pounds to your bench compared to your poly, it's might be an even trade off. Yeah. And I think the other place where it, I sometimes my, like my, it'll, it'll affect like my lower back a little more Mm -hmm. because, um, you, you kind of have to really pull those weights down sometimes to get them to touch. Mm -hmm. So that can get a little, that adds a little bit to it. But yeah, I mean, thinking back to when I was wearing poly shirts, it's definitely, definitely a little bit different in that aspect. Yeah, that's actually a good point too with, uh, and poly obviously bellying up is one of the huge things and helping you be able to touch and something that, um, isn't necessarily as important in a band shirt and probably can get away with a more flatter back in terms of being able to get to your touch too. Yeah. And then, so you mentioned the perfect storm in May. Um, obviously I was down there. That meet was hot as hell. Um, and it was, it was a great meet. Tom, Tommy A and them run a, a great meet and it's, uh, yeah. awesome to watch, but, um, Maybe tell us a little bit about how that day went for you. So, like you said, it was uh, here in Virginia, like it gets hot. We have humidity. Um, nothing like that. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. Like my hat's off to the people that live down there. You guys are crazy. Um, like CVA, we don't have heat or AC. So I think that kind of helped out a little bit because mm-hmm. we're kind of used to it, training in the hot. But, yeah, that was a that was a different, a different level. Yeah. Um, the day went all right. I just, I bombed out on the squats. Um, that was actually the first meet I've ever bombed out of. Oh, wow. And it just, it is what it is. I, I just didn't put them where the, where they needed to go. And that was that. Yeah. So I think we can maybe talk a little bit, not necessarily about the meet itself, but, um, in terms of maybe adjusting to different judging standards for, for some meets and things like that, because, Um, obviously we'd like it to be consistent across the board, but you know, at some meets that you can get away with a little bit more other meets you can't. So, um, as someone who's been doing this for a long time, what's kind of your, your gauge and kind of how you figure out where you need to be to get there, but not make it look ridiculous in either direction. Uh, so like usually in every video you can hear, that's one of my training partners calling my depth. Mm -hmm. He's been calling my depth for forever for the most part there's another guy that used to do it his name was paul paul win um he since he kind of moved on from the sport he did did his thing he had the all-time world record total at 165 for a, for a little while um but that's just that i go to wherever he says go and then uh i just go down until he says up unless i'm about to pass out and then i just come up yeah. i think that's something that's not really um understood well by maybe people who only compete raw that um no, it doesn't really matter if you're you're there or not if you're the one squatting you just kind of listen to your call and you got to trust that person because right. it is impossible to know where you are especially if you're fully cranked in a suit wrapped up and your your head's about to explode on the way down you just think you're just listening for one word and that's all you're trying to do <laughs> right and that's uh i mean that's that's uh that's all it's ever been um I, I will usually, usually on the opener, I'll pick somebody in the crowd or, or like something that's not going to move out in the audience and I'll fixate my view on that. And I'll kind of get a gauge of like, when he says up, that gives me an idea of like, when I'm going down in the hole on the second attempt. I kind of know I'm like, all right, I'm fucking close. Like just hang with it another second. And he's going to say up yeah. or maybe if he's at like one, I know like, all right, I'm going to just dip a little bit and come back up and 
you know, I mean, it's a game, right? Like two to one is a good lift. That's all I'm looking for. I, I don't, maybe that's not the right way, but I don't care. Two to one is a good lift in the rule book. Exactly. Uh, I kind of agree with you on that one, but, um, as far as uh, you mentioned the dip, I know some people like to incorporate that. Some people just don't do it, but, um, I, I'm not really sure in terms of, cause I've never tried that. Um, maybe what is the, obviously the purpose is to get to that last inch or so, but in terms of, um, maybe how much you're losing or how much it, it feels different compared to just waiting, uh, maybe tell about your experience in that. I don't do it very often. Um, cause I'm, I'm pretty slow on my descent. Um, usually for me, like when he says one, I usually, that's the point when I really push my knees out and open my legs up and that'll usually let me sink just a hair. And then from there, you know, like I said, unless and I'll keep going until he says up, cause you can only sit back so far. Eventually you have to sit down. Yeah. So usually for me, like when he says one, I open the knees up and I start trying to sit down. Um, I just know it's usually one is close enough. Like I said, if I feel like I'm about to lose it or if the, the world's going dark, like I just come back up. Yeah. And I think, um, that's a good point as far as opening up I've, something that I've kind of learned recently. Um, obviously there is sometimes when you're actually binding up and you just physically cannot get down further. But, um, a lot of people will sometimes get a, a false sense of being bound up, but, just doing that little extra opening up, especially as a, a larger guy, someone that has large legs that can get you there. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people too, especially when they're newer. Um, Cause everything you read and everything you see, even at the meets, people are yelling back, back, you know, like everybody thinks you, you only sit back. Well, you could, like I said, you only sit back so far before you're going to bend over and that <laughs> bar is going to fold you in half. So like they kind of forget that last little where you have to you have to sit down so um for me like i said that's my that's my point of i open the knees up and then i just try and sit down as best i can yeah and as far as sitting back too it kind of is a little bit dependent on how tight you can set your straps because that's what's keeping you up if, if you're not someone that wears straps like fully cranked and you keep trying to go back and back and back you're just gonna go down <laughs> right Right. So as far as your, your training group down at CVA, um, you said you've been down there for, for several years. Um, maybe tell us a bit, a little bit about your cruise culture and kind of how you guys operate down there. Um, so Carlos, the, it's owned by this uh, guy named Carlos. Um, it's probably a little different than most powerlifting gyms. I would imagine like he's always instilled a, like, what do you need to do as a lifter? So, like, I might train conjugate, other people train block, but we all train together. You know, there is no, it's not like a dictatorship. It's just a, do what you need to do to get better. I don't really care as long as you train. Mm -hmm. And you're not, like, going to get hurt. Like, that's his other big thing. And I, that's paid off a lot over the years as well. I didn't always listen to him. I mean, I'm pretty beaten, banged up. I just, as I've gotten older, I... I started paying more attention to what he was telling me and that's kind of led me to where I am now. Um, we got a good group of people. Uh, everybody competes mainly. Uh, most guys compete in equipment. Uh, there's a, there's one or two people that compete raw, but they'll probably be in equipment before too long. Yep. That's what I, that's what happened to me. <laughs> yeah. It happened to pretty much everyone at Evolve. <laughs> right. Uh, usually most guys when they come or most people, when they come there, you know, we don't pressure anybody into anything like whatever you want to do, yeah. right? You want to be raw, compete raw, man. It's, it's fine. You want to wear gear. Like usually I will say, we'll try and push people into like, look, do two or three meets and brawl first and actually learn how to power lift. And yeah. then we'll wear some gear. We'll worry about that later. Like, yeah, I think, um, it's, it's not, you hear that a lot. A lot of people, like if a raw guy kind of joins like a multiply crew, like, yeah, they, we don't get pressured into doing it, but when you see people squatting thousands of pounds and benching, hundreds of pounds that you think you'd never touch. You're like, well, shit, I want to try this. Right. Right. It's fun, man. Like I, you know, everybody, that's the one thing I love the most about the sport is 
it's one of the few sports, however you want to do it, you can do it. You want to just go out there with a single on and lift weights, go out there with a single on and lift weights. You want to, you know, wear whatever you want and compete unlimited and like it's the wild west, like you can do that too. I just don't like, I don't know, the whole, I mean, reading the internet comments and shit, people just, I don't know, I don't get it. Like, just lift weights, man. It's just however you want to do it, just do it. Yeah, exactly. I think um, one of the things in powerlifting that definitely needs to be more focused on is the community aspect of it um, and both divisions kind of coming together with raw and equipped because you go to any meet, there's going to be both raw and equipped. You're not competing against each other. You're competing with each other. Yeah. And uh, I'm just as much of a fan of like raw stuff as I am equipment. I just don't, I just don't like competing raw. That and I'm old. I'm beat up. That shit hurts. Like I just don't want to do it. But I love watching people lift big ass weights raw. Like somebody squatting a thousand pounds and like knee sleeves. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then um, so down in Virginia. Obviously, you've been training there for a long time. Um, do you guys host meets down there? Uh, we do not. No, Carlos never got into that. Uh, our space wouldn't allow it anyways. We got kind of a small, um, like, commercial uh, warehouse space. So it wouldn't be big enough for that anyways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then as far as you, um, maybe what's next in store for you? What kind of meets you eye and things like that? So I think uh, just talking with him, and brainstorming uh probably gonna shoot for the strength of heroes meet in september i think i'm just getting to the point of trying to do two meets in one year is just kind of pushing it a little bit here and there because the last thing i mean it's you know nobody knows when it's going to happen or if it's going to happen i think i'm just at the point like the last thing i want to do is push it too much and get hurt Mm mm-hmm so, um, even last year, like, obviously, you know, I bombed out of the, the showdown, um, which kind of allowed me to just bounce right back into training for worlds. Cause realistically, like, I don't, I just kind of joke with this, with the guys that drove down there, my training partners, you know, when we got back to the house, I was like, I was like, man, if I would have known that was just going to be max effort day, we could have just done that at home. Like, shit, you know, because that's all that really turned out for me was, you know, it's just three attempts in the squat and then go home. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, probably just probably just that for next year is uh, the Strength of Heroes meet up a blue collar. I got invited this year, but I already had Worlds on the table, so I was going to do that one. Yeah, that's a that's a great meet. I did that in what what year is it now? So I did that in twenty twenty three. I did that raw, and then I made my multiply debut what, a couple months ago at the the third one. So um, I, I'm thinking about maybe doing that one again. I don't know. It depends kind of where things land. I'm planning to do my next multiply meet in June, um, but so that might be a quick turnaround. But it's such a great meet, so I might just go down there and support and. If you're going down there to swing for that 3K again, I might just have to make the drive anyways. Yeah, that's the plan. Um, I usually don't put too much of my goals out there. I just kind of keep them to myself until they happen. But that one, I mean, unless I get fucking hurt really bad, like I'm pretty sure that one is going to happen. Like that's just having a, that's having the right day. That's all that really is going to boil down to. I think even Donnie Thompson and Dave Hoff would say the same thing. It's just a matter of having the right day. Yeah, exactly. It's just one of those things where you're you're already capable of it. You just kind of got to put it together that day. Right. Um. And then probably from there, there's there's specific meets like I want to do, but the overall goal right now is the three thousand, and then I definitely want to make it up to Hellbent for one of their meets. Um, I'd like to. I want to go down to north of the border, do one of those meets. Um, and I'd like to do a meet uh, out of the country as well. I'd yeah. like to do the Irish pro one time. Yeah. I, I saw that one. That one looks pretty cool. That's, um, that's something that I, I saw a lot of people starting to gain interest in and, um, think that's something that would be kind of cool to see because, over across the seas, uh, multiply is not really as as big or kind of. It's mostly a single ply world, so. 
Yeah. Sorry, my my phone's about to die. I got to plug it in. I was getting my girlfriend to get my charger. Okay, my I'll, I'll, I'll pause it real quick. Um, so yeah, I'd like to make it across there and do that one time. Seems cool. Um, I was going to try and do it next year, but the the logistics were just too much. Yeah, I, that's it's kind of one of the tough things with powerlifting is um, we still have to work our jobs. We we don't we can't go right. over there and make money. So it's it's something that um, as cool of an experience it would be, it's got to just kind of align with your life at that point. Yeah. Lucky for me, uh, I you know working for the fire department, I work shift work, so it's kind of easy to do the. Not necessarily easy, but like I can take leave and I can go places and do things. So that has op- afforded me the opportunity to do a lot of cool stuff like that. Some of it too is just the travel aspect. Like, um, that's kind of why I stick to. I do a couple, you know, local meets. Just because, you know, I don't, I don't make a fortune, and just like you said, it's I don't make money off of powerlifting, so, you know, I don't mind traveling. But man, it's a you know, by the time everything was said and done, just to travel to Florida, I mean, that was a couple thousand dollars by the time it was all over with. Yeah, I think that's one of the tougher things with um, being at that that level when you're getting invited to all these pro meets and not only do you have to decide what meet you want to do just because of i don't know maybe the you like the meet director or you know someone who's competing that you want to maybe compete against but it, it comes down to things like can i take work off this week can i can i afford to go down there things like that that um it's something that someone like in a, as a pro strongman that can make some money or like a bodybuilder it's like a it's a no-brainer right um I make it work out like that's probably the next the next couple of meets I do. I'll probably travel for a little bit. I want to go other places. Nothing wrong with uh, Matt Brooks meets. He does an awesome job. I just I'd like to go uh, see other do some other ones for a little bit. I'll definitely come back to his though. Like he does really good meets. Yeah, and that's a, another thing with powerlifting too is. Um kind of traveling and going to explore these meets not only do you get to compete in different places on different equipment and things like that but you get to meet maybe someone that you've been following on instagram for five years that you never seen before or you just get to meet a ton of new people and make a lot of friends along the way yeah yeah that's the cool thing about like the showdown um you know i followed pretty much everybody in that room for a long time and then to get to stand there with them was pretty cool i didn't get to talk to a lot of people um Mainly because, uh, you know, on meet day, I mean, I've heard it from people like I, I don't know, I'm probably not the most approachable person on meet day. I get it. I just, I'm there to compete and I'm there to like do certain things. Um, but, you, you know, when the day is over, I want nothing. I love sitting around talking about the day and hearing how people's days went and everything. I just. I don't know that meet. I, like I said, I got my first bomb out, and I just was kind of like, "I'm gonna get out of here." <laughs> yeah. And um, with multiply too, it's something that 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 level of focus that you need is just it's a, a different level than like a raw meet where you can just kind of stand around and shoot the shit. As long as you warm up fine, you're gonna have a fine day. But right. if you're warming up and on squats and you're not able to sit back and or your suit just feels a little bit off, like your your mindset's so shifted, you have to figure out all these different variables, and it can just get ugly. Right. And then um, obviously down the the storm too with dealing with that weather and um, all those, all those people, like everyone there squatting a thousand plus, like most people there. So you got to kind of time those warm ups and make sure all the plates are loaded and make sure they're loaded correctly. And just, it's just at that sort of level meet to be run that smooth as well. um, Definitely takes a lot of stress off the lifter. Oh yeah, that was a good. Like I would have done that one again this year. They just chose to, they they were only going to do multiply, so they were going to have unlimited, um, which is you know that's cool. Uh, hopefully, I know they had talked about not having that meet anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw a post about that, so hopefully, that isn't the case, and they do it again. I would like to do that meet again. That was one of the better meets I've ever been to. Yeah, and then I guess for the the last little segment here, we can talk about. 
um, some of your experiences in powerlifting as a culture, maybe some of the things that you love most about powerlifting and some of the things that you think could use a change or that kind of annoy you? Uh, probably the thing I love the most is just like we already talked about is the getting to meet the people. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I love watching people do stuff that they maybe thought they couldn't, mm -hmm. right? Like, more as a, I get it more when I go to like handle the other guys at the gym because I don't get to see it a lot when I'm competing. But, you know, talking to people in the warm up room and kind of hearing about how their training went and all that stuff and meeting people and just talking about powerlifting, that's probably my favorite part and then watching them you know and then that too and then going on and you know usually nowadays with social media everybody ends up following everybody so that's another cool part too like you when i met you know you were looking for a pair of briefs i sent you that pair of, and then i got to watch you you know had to do your first meet do your first multiply meet it was awesome yeah. it was great that's the kind of stuff i think gets lost in powerlifting because there's a ton of negative stuff everybody you know it's more social media i think and that's just one of it's good and bad you know people you post a video online everybody immediately like you're just the worst person ever at anything you know what i mean like that's probably the one thing that there's nothing i don't i don't know what you do about it other than just kind of ignore it and move on but that's probably the Probably the one thing I don't like the most. Like, we're all doing the same thing, man. We're all just lifting weights. Like, yeah. We're all equipped. Like, I don't know. I want to watch you lift the biggest weights possible. I don't care. Like, who cares that you, however you want to do it. Exactly. And as far as you sending me the briefs, that, that's something that I'll, I'll always appreciate you for. And that's something that um, what makes the multiply community so great. Like, I, I posted that. And within, like, two hours, you said, all right, what's your address? I'll send them. And just from there on, I mean, I'm still using those briefs. And um, if it something like that helps someone to get into the sport, like it's something that I want to carry forward in the future with, I don't know, maybe I'll be sending those briefs to someone else someday. So just yeah. like, things like that are just awesome to keep the sport alive. And it, it's people like you that help make the community better, stronger, and more connected. Yeah, like I said, I, I love this sport. I love everything about it. Um, it's giving me opportunity to do stuff that I didn't think I could do. I've met people that, you know, like Carlos, the gym owner, he's probably going to hate that I get into this, but it's all right. You know, that guy, definitely not like a yes man, not going to tell you what you want to hear, mm -hmm. but will tell you what you need to hear to do things. And he's one of the people. I remember walking in that gym and he's like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, man, I want to squat a thousand pounds. And uh, he was like, well, I'm not going to tell you you can't do it, but this is what it's going to take to do it. And, you know, we'll see how it goes as it goes. And just the meeting people like that, there's tons of people like that in this sport that like, you know, just help people. And I love it. I think it's great. I try and be one of those people when I can. Like, uh, I'm getting ready to go out to Elite in December for the – or like a training weekend thing. And those are always fun yeah. meeting new people, helping out. Like that's, it's always a good time. Yeah. And I think <clears throat> the, the more important people in the sport are the people like, like you said, Carlos, like it's not the, someone's going to blow smoke up your ass. If someone says, Hey, you want to reach this goal, I'll help you get to that goal, but you have to put in the work too. Right. And then other people, um, Sorry, other people along the way that have maybe inspired you or kind of some of the moments that you've met with people at meets, like what are some of the some of the people that you've met along the way that have um, maybe inspired you or kind of been great connections for you? Um, definitely, like we talked about up the. So definitely, like I was talking about Carlos, he's the, probably been one of the, uh, definitely inspired me to do things, especially where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. Like if it wasn't for that guy, that's, I wouldn't be doing any of this stuff. Um, 
another one, probably a lot of people have met him, um, would be Dave Tate. Yep. I've been out there to train a couple times and definitely, you know, he's another one not going to tell you what you want to hear. Yep. Um, I went out there for the train your ass off thing. It's kind of the individual, it's like five people go out there and train and same deal. He was another one. I kind of told him some goals I had and he was like, I mean, you can do it, but it's going to, this is what you're going to have to do. Um, and then probably I didn't meet this person through powerlifting, um, necessarily, but another one, was my friend Alan when he was alive. He's probably the one that really inspired all this because, you know, I used to, he was always interested in like what I was doing as far as powerlifting went. And, you know, I remember telling him, I was like, man, I want to, I want to squat a grand, but I don't know if, you know, like, I don't know if I can. And he's like, well, I mean, all them other guys do it. Why can't you? He's like, at least try. So, um, And then just other people I've got to talk to through the sport, like Delafay. He was cool to talk to. Yep. I've asked him stuff. He's got great ideas about training. Um, Skiba, all the stuff he puts out. Tenahero, all the stuff he puts out. Getting to talk to him at the storm, like that was really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I haven't really, other than that, uh, I haven't got to meet like a whole lot of people i guess um i think i'm still kind of a unknown maybe a little bit like (laughs) well i I think that's not something that should be um happening with a total like that i think i'm hoping that something like this this podcast episode and uh that that post by uh dr whoever the hell uh (laughs) helps get some more eyes on you but um, something I wanted to touch on is something that I've noticed by a lot of these top level powerlifters and basically everyone that's been on this podcast is, um, there's always someone that seems to take you under their wing for you as Carlos, for me, it was Rupo. It's just people like that, that, um, are great for the sport to bring people in and kind of help you rise up one day to bring someone else under your wing. Yeah. Um, and I think those people, you've probably noticed it too. I think those people, it's not just lifting. It's in life as well. Yes. So, um, because they do. They show you that, like, I mean, sometimes, you know, like, even if you don't make it, it's okay. Just figure out why. Yep. And fix it. Or maybe you just, it's not for you, period. Maybe you just don't like it. You know what I mean? They open your eyes to those type of things that, like, there's a lot of... I know it's probably cliche, but it is. But there's a lot of parallels between like lifting and life. You know what I mean? When the ser- in the sense of if you work hard enough and you put enough effort into it and you really want to do it, you can probably do it. You yeah. know, like and to at least try. You know, you know, being where I'm at right now with this. You know, that's all it was. I just put effort into it. I just tried. I never worried about uh, another thing. You know, you see people all the time comparing themselves to other people. I never worried about that stuff. I mean, I always knew there was people that were better than me. Like, that's obvious. Yeah. But I was never one to, like, compare myself to them until I was kind of standing, you know, in in a matter of words, in the same room with them. Like, now, sure, stand around sometimes and be like, man, like, Minus, obviously, we compete in different equipment, you know, like, I'm, I'm in the same conversation as like, you know, Bob Merck, and Donnie Thompson, and Dave Hoff, and all these other guys, you know what I mean? uh, But without, without those people at the very beginning, like you said, for, you know, Rupo, and for me, Carlos and Alan, like, to give you that, well, at least try, right? All you gotta do is try. If you fail, at least you tried. Yeah, and I think something, uh, a quote I heard last week uh, was completely unrelated to powerlifting, but something that kind of is a good mindset for for me moving forward and just anyone is, uh, so what, now what? So just immediately thinking, so what, you bombed out of a meet, now what, what's next? How are you going to train differently? How are you going to prepare yourself better? Right. 
yeah, and it's the truth. Like, uh, I kind of tell the guys at the gym, um, there's a few of them that have really big goals and they're totally going to do them as long as they put the work in. You know, I always tell them, like, once you get, you know, kind of look at the global picture and then scale it down from there and figure out how you're going to get there. But when you do those little goals, like, it's fine to be proud of yourself, right? It's not fine to be satisfied. Yes. Because once you're satisfied, you're not going to do anything else. Eventually, we're all going to be satisfied with something, I guess. But, like, that's kind of, I'm, you know, like I said, like, I'm, I'm, I, I'm proud of what I did, but I'm not satisfied with it because I know I can do more. Yeah, so. I think that's uh, the the trope of powerlifting is, I mean, even Dave Hoff, he has the heaviest total of all time. He's probably not satisfied either. <laughs> no. no. <clears throat> so. But I think um, we can kind of wrap things up here from there. Uh, I'll ask you my final question. If you could give a new powerlifter or someone going into their first meet a word of advice, what would that be? Just have fun. Just go out there. And have fun. Enjoy yourself. Because eventually one day, it's all going to be over anyways. We're all going to lift our heaviest weight. So just enjoy it. Don't compare yourself to anybody. Just go out there and be proud of what you did. They're your numbers. Nobody can ever take them from you. And be proud of them. Right? You train for them. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Yep. I totally agree. Uh, I like the, it, they are your numbers and no one's stealing them. It doesn't matter if someone beats you in that meet. It's still your best for that day, and right. you got to keep fighting for them. Exactly. So I want to thank you again for taking the time to come on. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me.